Hello travelers and welcome to Adventures in Security. I'm Tom Olzak and I'll be your host. In this episode, we explore the threat vector, DNS tunneling, and how to manage it. The main name service traffic freely travels across network perimeters and internal network segments. Organizations cannot arbitrarily block this UDP port 53 traffic because doing so would break most, if not all, network communication. Malicious actors, or MA, know this and have found ways to exploit DNS for their own purposes. One example of how MA exploit DNS is tunneling. DNS tunneling enables command and control, or C2, and data exfiltration traffic, for which most organizations don't look or are unable adequately to detect. This presentation is based on my research paper of the same name. It's available for download from the link shown. It includes everything in this presentation and includes all cited references. If you don't know how DNS is supposed to work, or if you need a refresher, please watch my DNS basics video at the link shown. I may have used DNS tunneling for about 10 years. As security professionals block or heavily control other channels like HTTPS, the use of DNS tunneling is increasing. In its 2019 threat report, CenturyLink writes that an average of 250 malicious domains are used for tunneling every day. In other research, Palo Alto Networks Unit 42 found that up to 80% of malware uses DNS to establish C2. DNS packets freely move across organization perimeters facing the Internet and across internal network segments. Arbitrarily blocking this traffic is not possible because doing so would break network communication. To use DNS tunneling, an MA uses a tunneling kit. These kits are available for free download. In general, the MA must place one component on her computer and one on the victim machine. This slide shows how this works. The MA registers a domain and creates an authoritative DNS server for that domain. The MA installs the DNS kit used on the MA side of the tunneling process. The MA often sets up a subdomain to which her authoritative server redirects the traffic. The subdomain can be on the MA's desktop, but how this is done depends on the MA's approach or the tunneling kit used. The user clicks on a lure link, phishing email, or website, for example. The MA process installs the client component of the tunneling kit. The victim component uses tunneling to send an encoded message, not encrypted, to the MA's computer to establish the C2 channel. In some cases, the MA uses this channel to install additional malware on the victim computer. MA usually use one of two methods to exchange information with victim computers, TNS text and A records. When using text records, a little more information can be transmitted in a single packet. The text record can include up to 255 characters in a single string. An MA can use multiple strings, but this would increase the size of the record, making it easily detectable by DNS firewalls. And we're going to talk about DNS firewalls later on in this video. This slide shows types of information that might be contained in an authorized, un, in an authorized text record. When using the domain name or Q name, the MA prepends encoded information onto the Q name label space. This slide shows how this is possible. The maximum length of the entire Q name is 253 characters, including the dots. Each label in the Q name can be up to 63 characters. This graphic shows what this might look like when an MA uses this approach to steal information. In this example, I created a set of credit card data. I then use base32 encode to encode the information. Encoding is not the same as encryption. It only obfuscates the label content. I then prepended the encoded information to my fictional website domain name. To conform to the Q name standard, I place dots to separate the information into labels no more than 63 characters each. When stealing large amounts of information, this approach can take a long time. However, advanced persistent threats have plenty of time when the right controls are not in place. Another use for tunneling with the Q name 
is providing a heartbeat. A heartbeat sent from the victim computer to the MA lets the MA know the infected machine is still available and waiting for commands. Today's best option for DNS tunneling defense is a DNS firewall. However, the functions included in DNS firewalls differ across vendors. In the next few slides, I'm going to describe the common approaches. Understanding their organization's risk and how these various approaches can mitigate that risk enables security professionals to ask vendors the right questions. The most basic DNS firewall uses a Response Policy Zone, or RPZ, placed on an organization's recursive name server. Developed by Paul Vixie and Vernon Scriver, an RPZ returns a response configured by the organization when a query is made for the address of a known malicious site. RPZ do not just prevent tunneling. They can also help prevent users from falling victim to any phishing lures that might result in malware infection or collection of sensitive information. In many implementations, a response from an RPZ-protected recursive server for a known malicious site returns the IP address of a walled garden. A walled garden is a location within the protected organization where the user is provided a warning or where the security team can analyze the request and its origin. This is an example of a walled garden message page provided by Malware Patrol, displayed to a user to warn of either risky behavior or an infected device. RPZ are regularly updated, at least daily, by the threat intelligence organizations that create and manage them. Once installed, the RPZ updates itself without intervention by the security team. To ensure the recursive server, DNS firewall, remains effective, the recursive server must be solidly locked down and isolated from the Internet. Quad9 is a free online DNS service that uses RPZ. It is provided by a nonprofit organization supported by IBM, the Packet Clearinghouse, and the Global Cyber Alliance. Simply directing your DNS resolution queries to 9.9.9.9 .9 provides immediate RPZ protection. If an organization wants to configure and manage its own RPZ zone-based DNS firewall, its security team can manage regularly updated RPZs from multiple vendors, including those shown here. Using an RPZ is a good start. However, it relies on protecting against known domain names. Because MA understand this, many have taken steps to circumvent RPZ protection. Domain generation algorithms are used by MA frequently to create new domain names. A DGA often uses a seed and a changing value to create these names. A popular changing value is current date and time. MA register these new names, and infected systems begin, begin using them as configured in the installed tunneling kit. New names are often created every day, and seeds are changed as needed. This is what a DGA created domain name might look like. DGA makes it challenging to keep up with malicious domains for inclusion in an RPZ. One's defense against this is predictive mitigation. With predictive mitigation, a security vendor uses known DBA algorithms, associated seeds, and changing values to create sets of possible domain names the MA will use. This is usually coupled with RPZ content. Engram analysis selects a slice of the Q name and assesses its entropy. This can also be applied to text record text payloads. For example, in this example, I selected an engram from the Q name that I showed you previously. We then use machine intelligence or a specially designed algorithm to check the entropy. In this example, there are no dictionary or significant occurrences of common combinations of characters expected in common Q names. Some vendors use machine learning to increase the accuracy of this approach. Minimally, high entropy should cause an alert. According to QuickSprout, Q names fall into an expected length range, 32 to 48 characters. Consequently, organizations should consider alerting on Q names greater than 50 characters. Tuning will help arrive at the right length threshold. Each DNS query type has common patterns. If a query pattern moves too far from a baseline, the DNS defenses should send an alert. Not all environments are the same, so again, tuning is necessary to minimize false patterns. If an organization does not do business with high-risk countries or regions, it should consider blocking those locations. 
A good start is blocking IP address ranges associated with China, Brazil, and the Russian Federation. IP lo IP2 location provides IP addresses by country, both for viewing and for download. This is a graphic from Symantec that shows the top sources, top geographic sources for cyber attacks. Another related service is reputation analysis. Reputation analysis provides information about known malicious IP addresses and the likelihood that an IP address or IP address range is malicious. An example of this is the Bright Cloud IP Reputation Service. The previous controls are needed because we have to assume MA will infect one or more endpoint devices. Mitigating risks associated with endpoint device infection is still the foundation of most of our security efforts today. Hardening begins with application whitelisting or simply blocking users from installing any software on their devices. Removal of local admin access from users anti-malware, host-based firewall, host-based IDS, and network segmentation. No one defense approach listed here is usually enough to protect an organization. Security teams must identify high-value targets, calculate associated risk, and then look for a solution that applies the needed set of defenses. We usually place firewalls at the network perimeter. However, this is not considered by many security professionals to be the correct location for DNS firewalls. Much, if not most, of an organization's DNS traffic is used to find on-premises resources. For example, Windows uses DNS to locate a domain controller during user login. MA also uses DNS to move laterally across an infected network to reach additional targets. Organizations should consider placing DNS firewalls so that they monitor both internal and internet-directed DNS traffic. Well, that's it for today. Please subscribe to my channel to keep up with emerging and changing security challenges. Until next time, be careful what you click.